This week, Dan Tentler, founder of the Phobos Group, comes on to talk about attack surface discovery and enumeration. Next up, Sumed Takar, CEO of Qualys, joins us to discuss digital transformation's impact on IT asset visibility. In the news, establishing confidence in IoT device security. How do we get there? The JBS hack, latest escalation of Russia-based aggression. Why vulnerability management is the key to stopping attacks, overcoming compliance issues in cloud computing. Attacks on a meat supplier came from Revel, the ransomware's most cutthroat gang, according to the news. WordPress plugins are responsible for 98% of all vulnerabilities. I think they mean in WordPress. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. When it comes to web app and API security, the choice is simple. You can choose Fastly's security solution that teams will actually use in full blocking mode, just like 90% of their customers. Or you can stick with costly options that you probably just turn off. You can get Fastly's all-in-one platform that protects apps everywhere they live, however they're built. Or departments can agree to disagree. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly to learn more. Or you can just wish you had. Cyber criminals are using social engineering, loaded with urgency and fear, to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard-to-detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda and welcome to the show but first let me introduce you to a man who finally figured out why he never looks good in pictures it's his face mr paul acidorian oh welcome to paul security weekly it's episode number 697 recorded june 3rd 2021 right here in g unit studios in rhode island to my left the illustrious mr larry pesce where oh hey there, hey, there he is well, well, hey look there i am What's going on, dude? It's good That's to have good. you here yeah, in the studio. I got, I got this drink with this convenient little pour this, spout. Yeah. Wait. I didn't have glasses. We're drinking Micheladas. Oh. It's my, my new favorite <laughs> drink. <laughs> I've no, never, I mean, you know, I've it's never, very... I've, I've it's, never had one, and I'm like, sure, why not? And I get the little sippy cup. Yeah. But How do you like it, though? Is it good? Uh, the sippy cup or the drink? The drink. Eh. Eh. It, it, it'll get you drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that good, huh? Yeah. On the lines remotely, Mr. <clears throat> Tyler Robinson... Is he a rep- representing ten- Tennessee tonight with his <laughs> attire? <laughs> Tennessee? I mean, I'm still on vacation. Arkansas. I actually forgot it was Thursday, to be very honest. <laughs> I see what you wear on non-Thursdays now. It's very huh. interesting attire. It's good to have you on, though. Uh, it's good to be here. Yes, Mr. Jeff Mann is on the lines remotely. Jeff, welcome. I feel like it's been a while. I, it's, it's good, good to, to have you back, everyone. man. I missed yeah. you. Missed you guys too. There wasn't enough curmudgeon on the show. I just I can't muster up enough curmudgeon to uh, compete to Jeff. <laughs> I'll try to make up for it, especially given uh, Dan's teaser of a topic in the in the show notes. Oh, good. <laughs> Mr. Lee Neely is here with us remotely. Welcome, Lee. Uh, good to be here. Ready, enjoying that it didn't quite get to triple digit temperatures today. It's hot, huh? Oof. Yeah. Oh, that's why Tyler's in in the wife beater. <laughs> It's hot. I get it. I get it. Then it's, it's hot acceptable. in Tennessee. It's hot in Tennessee. Then, then it's acceptable. Yeah. If you want to the stay, if you want to stay in the loop, all things Security Weekly, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher or our YouTube channel, or you can sign up for our mailing list and you can join our Discord channel or find us on Twitch. There's a lot of ors and ands in there, but securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe will get you there to engage with security weekly we are also ecstatic to announce is that the replacement for more than happy now it's been replaced we are ecstatic now to announce that security weekly unlocked will be held in person this december 5th through the 8th at the hilton lake buena vista call for presentations and early registration for security weekly listeners is open 
now. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked to submit your presentation and register for the early registration price before it expires. I don't know what that price is, but it's early, so therefore it must be good. <laughs> uh, on the CFP, how about war stories? Are they permitted? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. They're, they're encouraged. In fact. <laughs> yeah. All right. With us uh, uh, this evening is Dan Tentler, the executive founder of Phobos Group, a boutique information services and products company focused on shifting the overtone window from compliance to actual measurable security. Dan, it's nice to have you on the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. I can't believe it's been this long since you, you've never been on the show before, have you? I have never been on the show. I've been like pressed up against the bulletproof glass for like 10 years watching <laughs> in. So look at all the cool kids doing cool kid stuff. I'm just out here trying not to get shot. <laughs> Dan, Dan and I have at least graced the stage together at uh, DEF CON yeah, yeah. once. Oh, yeah. So. I believe, if I recall correctly, there was a, a um, mason jar of uh, apple flavored moonshine and a cloak involved. Yes. Yes, yes, there was. Uh, That's how and, all good times start with and, Larry. And, we, and the sad part is, we took donations um, for pancreatic uh, cancer research, and uh, one of the gentlemen came up and said, "Hey, will you take casino chips for donations?" And I'm like, "Shit, it's all money. Like, mm. those two chips are still in my bag." <laughs> <Don't>, oh, oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oops. They don't earn interest, you <laughs> no, know. No, I know they don't. Yeah. Were they hundies? That one of them was. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Like, huh. I got beer money in Vegas next time I go. Yeah. Well, Dan, given that you have not been on the show uh, before, mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, for you to tell us about how you got your start in information security. Oh, boy. Um, so officially, uh, I jumped ship in 2008. Uh, in 2008, I was on a contract doing like systems architecture at Intuit and ended up um, at, the, at the culmination of that. Uh, contract essentially flipping a table and walking away and saying, I'm just going to go do security full time now because this. Um, you Wait, know. when you say like essentially flipping a table, is that like figurative or, or literal flipping of a table? Uh, I went on vacation to see at the time my girlfriend, who is now my wife in England. And when I came back, uh, instead of an office, there were two Indian contractors in my office and all my stuff was in a corner. Um, and this was a surprise. Whoa. So I was like, um, what, what? what and they were like yeah i remember when we asked you if you wanted to convert to a full-time employee and you didn't give us a straight answer i'm like yeah it's because i was going on vacation huh. um yeah so i was like I'm, I'm done this is silly so at that point i basically switched from like building things for intuit to um like helping people realize that when your wordpress blog gets hacked there are usually logs involved and you can like read the logs and learn things about the attacker. Um, well, that's and, not a thing. Oh, uh, well, well, yeah. And <laughs> it's probably more of a thing now than it was in 2008. But in 2008, yeah. people were paying for security consultants to help walk them through this sort of thing. Um, and then it was the sort of like blind man groping around in the dark kind of thing, trying to figure out like, what can I do that I'm good at in terms of like freelancing and ended up doing onesie twosie little pen tests and growing stuff here and there. Um, and then taking on larger contracts and then at some point getting invited to be part of startups. So, um, oh, also, um, shenanigans on Twitter tended to help quite a lot, like going on, like what ended up being called showdown safaris, uh, was like a pretty amusing thing to do at like four in the morning. Um, I got a lot more attention than I ever thought that it would, and I, I imagine that it contributed a lot to why um, people pay attention to me at all. But um, it made for some interesting conference talks. That was for, that was fun, like having the FBI approach me at TourCon and ask me um, how how viable actually is it that people can just get into uh, red light or like uh, intersection red lights, like traffic lights, and start messing with traffic lights. And I'm like, well, it depends on how targeted you want to be. And he was like. C can you track me going across the United States if I were to go on a road trip? And I'm like, yes, but I have to give you like four cities in the United States and you have to magically teleport between them mm -hmm. because the number of systems that I found is so small that they only exist. There's like four in Louisiana and like one somewhere on the West coast. Like it's not prevalent necessarily, but like getting an idea of, yeah, these are like two or four U units that get installed into like a rack on the side of the road that have just Telnet open. 
And if they didn't do the networking correctly, that box is just on the internet and you can telnet into it and mess around with traffic lights over telnet. Here, let me show you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been a while since I found them, but like, I think, I think after the FBI came to see me about it, um, uh, and after several other security researchers made a big deal about it on Twitter, they started to sort of dwindle. I haven't looked for any in a, quite a while, but like, um, I'd have to go back into one of my slide decks and find the example slide. Cause easy, the way you fingerprint these things is you just, you look at the text, right? If you, you can get into one, uh, and you can get what the banner looks like or what, like the first, cause this, these things are like, um, you know, old school Cisco, Cisco is you tell it into them and it'd give you like bad ANSI art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was the same thing with ease. It would give you like a corporate logo and you could use that because it's just text, right? You could use that as a search parameter and say, you know, go to Shodan and say everything on port 23 that has this, these characters in the, in the, uh, uh, telnet banner and you just traffic lights. I, so. I could just listen to you talk all night, Dan. Uh, I feel like you were involved in the security community before 2008 though. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I, I think my first DEF CON was DEF CON 16 mm. and that must've been 2004 mm. or something. But yeah, so like, it took me a while to realize that security was a, like an actual job. Like, <laughs> I, like I, I didn't know. I just thought it was like people were people who were sysadmins or systems architects that were just like really nerdy about security. Um, so I was, I, I kept applying for jobs as like a, an IT guy with like a heavy emphasis on security mm. and it never got hired anywhere um, because they, that's not what they cared about. Like um, it, it didn't dawn on me until later that like security was its own profession and not just like a flavor of sysadmin, um, mm. which fast forward to today. And now it is kind of sort of a flavor of sysadmin. Like if you can't Linux or you can't MTA or you can't networking or you can't VLAN, then like, it's challenging to be effective in security. Like how are you going to secure technology? If you have absolutely no idea how that technology works. Certainly so in, in the technical roles in security, that's, so that's true. very true. Sure. Mm. So uh, how did you yeah. get like, you're like enamored with Shodan. It seems is that. I'll, I'll tell you the story. It was really amusing. So um, I did several uh, stints as a contractor into it. And, uh, me discovering Shodan ended up being um, a side effect of me trying to do like a trapeze act around at the time. And this must have been 2010. Uh, uh, Intuit's policies regarding port scans and enumeration of the network. At the time, I had been brought in to help them develop their SOC. And uh, they wanted me just to to sort of do my thing. And then they had several other people that were very new to security at all, basically just copy pasting the things that I was doing. Um, the, the trouble was that there was this decree that said under penalty of death, uh, you may not end map without explicit written permission from several like sea level leaders, like including the CISO. And I'm like, uh, so I have to get written permission from the CISO to do basic enumeration inside of the environment. But like, if I look at the WAN and I look at the PCAPs, I'm seeing three dozen countries scanning us 24 seven. They can do that without reprisal, but I'm the defender and I can't get the same data that the attackers have. And they were like, yes, exactly. Uh... Okay. So like I wasn't doing CTFs then. But like it now, like in retrospect, I'm like, okay, so this is basically a CTF. I have to figure out how I can invent sort of creative articulation or come up with language to, to give myself a defensible position whereby like somehow I have gotten this data and the only possible way to have gotten this data is to have done a port scan, but there is no actual evidence that I have done a port scan. H how did I do the thing? Do they care about how I got from point A to point B? Will they, will they flip out about it? Um, or will they only care if they see, like, God, what was it at the time? Um, it wasn't Tripwire. It was It was an IDS. It started with an S. I don't remember Snort. where. They're gone now. Snort? Snort. So, no, not Snort. It was um, <clears throat> something else. It, there were appliances. There were white, white appliances, like white 2U appliances. Um, 
Net ranger. I forget Dra- what they were dragon? called. Dragon? Dra- wasn't Dragon. Wasn't Net ranger. No, it was dragon. a or s- sense or I, I don't remember. It's been it's been a while. Um, I have been I have been trying to uh, uh, actively pickle my brain, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I forget what they were called. Um, Suricata. Anyhow. No, it wasn't sort It wasn't a software project. It was like some vendor that sold mm. sold hardware that got folded into some other vendor later. But like, was that what Cisco called Net Ranger back no. in the day? Or this is after uh, it, that? It'll, it'll come to me in like half an <laughs> yeah, hour. Yeah, don't worry. I thought it was fun to go down memory lane though. Yeah, but yeah. yeah until so like, the end of the interview, clock is running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um. Oh, did we have actual topics we were going to talk about? I was just having fun listening to Dan. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess the topic in general is like uh, uh, enumerating attack surfaces that are publicly exposed, which this technically qualifies mm. as. Because, like, the idea was that like I'm faced with this bizarre um, sort of contrarian position of like my job title is I should go find bad guys, I should do threat hunting was before they called it threat hunting, but I am crippled because i am unable to use the commonplace tools that anyone would use to even get an idea of what the equipment that i need to try to secure actually is so how do i get an idea of what there is and what bad guys would go for uh if i'm not allowed to scan Uh, dan who says you're not allowed to scan i mean lots of people scan the internet Oh no! Well, so this the story was that I was I was in the socket into it, and oh. the parameters of my job at into it policy was you couldn't scan. Yes, exactly. They were like, we have a guillotine, and if you scan anything without permission, we put you in the guillotine. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's weird, but okay. So um, I don't remember how I discovered it, but I discovered Shodan, and it was like this search engine that scans the internet. So I just started plugging in into its publicly accessible ranges and just the scroll holy crap the scroll and i'm like you guys maybe you should let the blue team scan things because like do you have any idea what is flapping around on the like dozens and dozens of like developer boxes that were in a dmz with like a firewall hole poked in and it was just i call it naked tomcat like completely (laughs) unconfigured tomcat uh-huh. Like manager, manager will get you in, and mm-hmm. then there's Metasploit payloads, and just yeah, and it dozens. And I'm like, dude, you guys. Um, and they were like, you didn't scan. I'm like, no, I did scan. I used a search engine. And they're like, wait, what? W- w- you you found this in a search engine? And I'm like, yeah, maybe we should like revise the policy. Yeah, maybe we should unfuck that, this. <laughs> yeah, and then at that point, I was like, holy shit, what else am I gonna find? And then I just it just. Went. Now, fast forward to today, there's so many search engines the, to find all that yep. stuff. And the irony, and more. And the irony is the sh- search engine Dan used was called Show Dan. <laughs> <laughs> the it's, irony's not is, lost on me. It is. It has been an interesting, <laughs> an interesting trajectory having like three quarters of the people that talk to me about Show Dan believe that I am its author or that it was invented either for me or by me because of exactly that sentiment. It is show Dan. And it's like, no show Dan is a video game character. John Matherly is the guy. He was in San Diego for a while and he ended up, he was, when I met him, he was working for a company that ended up being one of my customers at the time. Um, but uh, I met the guy. He's a really, really nice guy, really smart dude, but he moved to Austin several years ago. But um, yeah, so it was interesting having that guy in town. I could like, give him feature requests and there's a bunch of stuff on that on that site now that's there pretty much because i was begging him to help me write code and you don't want me to write code i'm not a dev mm. um but yeah at the time was, he, before was, he, was john like hey i gotta show dan this <laughs> 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 no I, I think i think he came up with it before we'd met but like it'd be an interesting thing to retcon that story and then and then have him contend with having to like deal with people asking questions about it <sighs> And now there's yeah. a whole now there's a whole category around what we call attack surface management. That's right. Yep. And there's like five five companies of which Phobos Group is one that make a product that does this sort of stuff. Eh, more but, like uh, more like twelve, but really? Wow. Yeah. We we tested uh, nine out of the twelve, I think. 
mm. in our first labs product review. <laughs> so what actually qualifies it to be an attack surface management product? Like is something like URL scan, is that considered attack management? Like um, how does that, how does that classification happen? I think conceptually it's like something that tries its best to discover all of the surfaces of a business that are publicly accessible and then makes some assessment of how scary the findings are. Hmm. And does that include uh, scanning and looking for things that get exposed uh, or is it simply what is provided by the company? Things like similar to Shodan where it is actually just doing scans. Uh, are they looking at S3 buckets? Just trying to kind of define that so we can talk about a couple interesting aspects of, of what these products have, have kind of brought to bear. Uh, it's a mixed bag. Like ours, Orbital, um, we try and find, we, we stepped off the beaten path, right? So like pick a security tool. It doesn't matter what tool it is or what department it's in or what it does. Pick a tool. Chances are nine out of 10 of the choices you make is that the security tool tends not to be a security tool. It's like a compliance tool wearing a rubber Scooby-Doo mask that says security on the front. Like these tools by and large tend to exist to just satiate people's persistent demand to do the fastest, cheapest, least intrusive, least amount of work to like get past whatever audit they're doing and not to like fix real problems. So like um, the different entrants in that category will have like dramatically different categories of stuff that they inspect and do. Like there's some companies that, that do what they call attack surface management or attack surface monitoring. And all they do is mess with DNS. Like that's it. Like hmm. the only source of information they have is DNS. And they do yeah. a bunch of interesting like slicey, a mask, slicey. Like a, a mask can do that and it's free. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, that that's, that's brute force. Sure. But like, um, yeah. So that's like a, a segment of it. Right. Um, and then there's others that are like um, cloud only, like you plug it into your S3 config, or not S3, sorry, rather, e EC2 config, and it spiders all of the um, uh, settings and, and looks and see like, do you have IAM configured correctly? And uh, are your ACLs configured right? Do you have any any all over the place? Yeah, but that's, a, on? that's more cloud posture management than it is attack surface management in my mind, Dan, because it's not, yeah. I want to know about the other AWS accounts that I don't know about. And that's why I want attack surface monitoring because I wanted to figure that out. Yeah. Well, so, so conceptually, so like our position on it is if you, if you're, if you're a security organization and you're offering services to customers and you're not like, especially if you're doing like pen test or red team, um, if you're offering pen test and red team services and you're not showing your customers what real bad guys are actually doing in real life to victims, you're doing a bit of a disservice because by and large, again, like most people get pen tests because somebody is twisting their arm to get one, not because they want to get one or because they're interested in the results or that they want to secure their infrastructure. Most people get a yeah, pen test. We're going to talk PCI. <laughs> cool. <laughs> but like, Oh boy. Yeah. Um, they, no, these things do, do not okay. measurably impact security. And, and like, um, you, you guys have heard of Thinkst, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. like, did you see Adrian and Haroon's talk from the uh, Virus Bulletin 2019 keynote? Uh, Adrian, if you're listening, I, 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 I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so the, the, the TLDR enough. is like, essentially it's um, the title of the talk is the security products. I think it's security products or security companies we deserve. And it's essentially Harun and Adrian on stage saying, here's how you can buy certifications and awards. Like you can just buy credibility. Here's how startup companies basically defraud their investors to get a whole bunch of investment dollars and then have a product oh. that does nothing. Yeah. That was just yeah. one reason why we hired Adrian to do our labs testing. <laughs> yeah. So like the industry by and large tends to be a shitload of smoke and mirrors. It's, it's all just to placate the big four and to placate um, um, compliance auditing. So we were like, well, that's dumb. Like, that's just stupid. Like we got like, 
let's look at colonial pipeline right because let's beat up on those guys some more my god um like when they made the news i started looking at their perimeter and i found like iis 8.5 um and iis 7 publicly exposed and then a couple of other things i'd have to go back and find my twitter thread but i had some screenshots of stuff like they had weird products i'd never heard of that were like one of the fun things you can do is like look at a thing that is a website or like an appliance or a tool or whatever it is find the like copyright dates on there and the copyright dates will give you a really good indicator of when the last time it was patched so if you're looking at a thing and the thing says copyright 2013 (laughs) chances are pretty good you can shell it if you want right and that that's also uh, uh, it, if you, you, you guys are familiar with the term telegraphing, mm-hmm. it, it telegraphs mm-hmm. things. So if they have shit on the perimeter, that's like almost 10 years old, it telegraphs the fact that they're okay with things on their perimeter being 10 years old and that the chances are really good that their land is way worse than their WAN. Because if their WAN is supposed to be like stuff that's been hardened and, or made safe because it's publicly exposed, then like what monsters lurk in the deep of their land so like when you find iis 7 and 8.5 on their perimeter what on earth is going on on their land so like when you find that and you find like leaked credentials and other things of that nature like nessus won't show that to you like nexpos won't tell you that that's a problem like Every other security tool is dependent on MITRE, like in its entirety. Like if CVEs went away, all of these tools would break, right? So like the other interesting thing to consider is how strong is your security posture if the only things that you're tracking are known bugs? Are you looking at stuff that is unknown? And you're going to say, but Vitz, how do you know the unknown? And I'm like, well, I got a 2.2 terabyte database of credentials, a thousand of which are for your domain. And you have OA over here with no 2FA. So if I just monkey island those two together, how many of those creds work? Uh, I All think, I need is one. Dan, I think it's a little unfair to the VM market. I think it's a little better. I think in your example of IIS 6 and 7, it, it, would, it would find that stuff. But where I think... There's a huge gap, right, between attack service management and vulnerable. Well, the gap that ASM fills is if I don't know that I have IS7 hanging out there, my VM mm. scanner isn't going to scan it, and it's not going to tell me about it, right? Right. And, and well, that- the other thing to contend with is, have you ever used Qualys ever? Officially or unofficially? It doesn't matter. My question is, do you... Do you find a 600 page report an enjoyable thing to deal with? Or when you get a, a 40 meg PDF out of your security tool, do you groan and say, fuck, and pour more rum into your mug? Because I'm in the second camp. I, I don't have two business days to read a 600 page report that's largely copy pasta of how to fix cross site scripting over and over and over and over and over again. Well, to be fair, Vis, the the I, I, I'm with you on a lot of what you're saying in terms of the, the you know these exercises that many companies do because compliance makes them do it, and they don't really care. It's not that they don't care; they just don't want to pay more than they have to for something that they don't understand and don't get any use out of. But um, they're also approaching this from the perspective of these tools are what they're relying on to discover things. And I would wholeheartedly uh, uh, state that that's uh, a misuse of those tools and certainly not what PCI ever intended. So what do you say to those companies that are relying on these scan engines of, of the various ilk to know anything that's going on in their in their network uh, exclusively? Um, in my experience... Um there seem to be sort of three camps of folks that you can find that tend to be like on the blue team side of things. There's the one camp that I love to beat up on, which are the people that like Sony pictures is squarely in this camp, right? Like when, when they got popped in God, when 2012, 2013, something like that, when that thing happened with Sony pictures, um, their org chart 
was one of the things that got leaked. And their org chart for the security department was CISO, several VPs, several managers, several more managers, and two analysts with hands on keyboard. And they had like a 10 plus million dollar um, um, security, annual security budget. Um, and the, <clears throat> the two analysts were getting moderate salaries, but like all of that budget turned into bonuses for that management structure. So like those people got popped. Well, I spent like a week and a half going over the leak data because I managed to get a copy of it, um, which is one of the times the FBI showed up to my house. Um, <laughs> only one. Yeah. Well, so far it's only been one, uh, but uh, it hasn't they stopped them to your me. house. They've tracked you down in, in other places. <laughs> uh, well, the way I understand it worked was that um, apparently if you're wealthy enough, you can just direct the FBI. And Sony Pictures did, and they were like, "Hey, there's this guy who's making us look bad in the press. Can you go talk to him, please?" So Yikes. that was colorful. But uh, the dump of data showed that they had like the vast majority of passwords that were in that leak data were like all caps, six characters, no numbers. So like the things that they were doing, well, there were artifacts in the in the leak data that telegraphed what their internal security posture was. And then of course, you know, Shodan showed us even more, but like it was trivial to assert that um, they weren't using 2FA, they had terrible practices, they had horrible password security policies. Like they were doing arguably less than what had been mandated in even like Sarbanes-Oxley. So they're just another example of a shop that does as little as they can get away with, which tends to be even less than what they're legally required to do. Um, so that's like, we'll call that camp a, right. The first can you give camp. It, can you give them a score, Dan, like on a scale of one to 10? Aren't there companies oh. that do that? How many companies do that? I said, aren't there companies that do that? Oh, aren't there? Facetious, yes. Uh, like, do you, do, do you think you can assign a score about what, uh, and base that on what you can find externally? Oh, I'll, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I can. Well, I think the term is where there's smoke, there's fire, right? <laughs> so, like, if they have PHP my admin on their WAN and the scan for that IP <clears throat> results in, like, it's a Fortinet login on port 80 that redirects to 443, and then 8443 is a, a hole poked using NAT to some internal host with PHP my admin. And like you can admin admin your way into their firewall. Well, if their firewall is the secure thing on their network, then what else is there gonna be? Because I mean, I, the, but, but what if the, well, I'll play devil's advocate? What if that's just like one department in your organization that is running rogue and standing up firewalls and leaving the password admin admin? Cool. So like um, in this in this example, I'll be what was it? The dark side ransomware gang. I don't care. Mm. That's, that's their problem. That's their silly internal politics. I don't give a shit as an attacker. I'm going to shell the shit out of them and ransomware everything I see. So if admin admin gets me in the land, I still get my ransom. They still fall over. They make the news. Their pipeline gets shut off or whatever. But like, back to my point of like, if you're not telling your customers what real bad guys are doing and how real bad guys are getting in and your entire business model is just doing like, a stencil with spray paint to hit only the points on the map where you know the you know uh, the, one of the big four is going to look when they come in to do the audit then you're doing a disservice to your customers because yes maybe you're helping them get past their audits but you're functionally not helping them at all with security in any way shape or form so like um it, it doesn't matter if it's a rogue department standing up firewalls and poking holes in the wan like it's at the end of the day there's like there's going to be somebody that is the throat to choke in the company, right? So it's going to be like the CISO or the head of IT or the CIO or the CTO or whoever is the leadership person that is in charge of all of those subordinate people. So if you have somebody in charge, like, um, uh, and I, I can't speak to this person's technical expertise, but like the, the, the lady who was um, the CISO at Equifax, when they got popped, uh, when people started looking into her, it turns out that she was like a music major. And people were like, no, you shouldn't condescend to people that have weird um, backgrounds because, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't technical. And it's like, okay, cool. That's a fair point. But like, 
does a music music major have enough technical chops to like lead the security team at a place like Equifax? How much and, technical and, chops do you need to lead a security team at that level, though, Dan? I don't think I personally well, believe you, you don't. I mean, I think leadership in a certain level of understanding of technical concepts is required. Um, I think you know, in the medical field, everyone going in has to take a class on terminology to be familiar with some of that terminology. You know, that doesn't mean that everyone goes in as a brain surgeon either. Uh, that's true. But the people that are doing the brain surgery aren't the people that run the hospital. Yes. Um, uh, so um, if you like, I guess the, to rephrase your question, it's like saying, I'm going to buy a NASCAR or I'm going to buy a NASCAR team and I'm going to buy a car and I'm going to have this whole thing under me. But I've never seen a car before. Uh, I don't know what an engine is. I've never driven in a car. I don't know what a road is. So like, can I be, can I, as a leader be expected to make informed decisions if I don't even understand the basics surrounding the environment that I'm supposed to manage? Like, like, for example, I'm not a paleontologist. I should not run a museum. I don't know the first thing about digging up dinosaur bones. So like, if I were to go manage the, like the natural history museum in London, I would do a completely shit job and I would cause all sorts of problems because I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. But like, for some reason, this is okay in security. We're okay with people who have no fucking idea at all being in charge in security. So like we look at the news and every week there is some major hack or major problem or major exploit or like everything's burning down all the time. So you got to ask yourself, like we've been doing this thing for 20 years, 25 years now, which is like, just take somebody, smack a tie on them and stick them in charge. Oh shit. The building burned down. Well, maybe we should stop taking random people off the street, sticking ties on them and putting them in charge. Maybe we should like put somebody that knows what they're doing up there. So I guess that's my point is like, obviously what we have been doing hasn't been working because it feels like security is not getting better. It feels like more companies are burning down and more companies are getting ransomware and more companies are getting hacked. So like, maybe we should change our approach. Do you think it's because they, they don't know about the exposures to their organization they haven't worked hard enough to find them or like they just can't There's, convince management that that it's important or it's all a mixed above, bag right? it's a mixed bag and i'll tell you why so um uh at a previous place before phobos group uh we had a customer that did they were in finance and they were a software dev shop and they wrote a stock trading platform or they had they contributed code to a stock trading platform. Um, because of FINRA and FISMA, uh, because of the regulatory um, bodies that they had to report to, they were and you're going to love this. And unless you already know, then you you may only chuckle. Um, they explicitly had us work through their lawyers and made the relationship between us and them be attorney client privilege because. If we were to have turned in findings to the technical staff at the company, they would have been forced to do a bunch of disclosures to FINRA and FISMA, uh, and, and they would have suffered fines and problems because apparently the regulatory bodies that govern financial organizations make no differentiation between something like a red team and an actual breach. So they were of the position of, and I literally mean this, don't tell us shit. We don't want to know. Don't say anything. If you find bugs, don't say shit. Tell the lawyers. So like, depending on what vertical you're in, you, you've probably heard the term. I'm sure you have. You've been in security way longer than me. Um, you've heard the term perverse incentives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. It's, it, that's the crux of everything. It's that if you're a CISO of a publicly traded company, you are not graded and judged on how well you do your job. You are graded and judged on, can you deflect problems in your position that would cause a negative impact to the stock price? Yeah. And, and, and if, if de-risking it is not necessarily ignoring it, those are different things. Uh, granted, but, but in practice, like if you're an incoming CISO 
and you get the talk where they say, look, we're going to give you a $2 million golden parachute, but all you got to do is just sit on your hands for two years and do nothing. Then you can roll out of here, collect your, you know, golden parachute bonus and the next one can roll in. Um, they are incentivized to do absolutely nothing, especially if you're a non-technical, especially if you have no idea how computers work, because then you are intimidated by change. So you're going to have your staff under you screaming about, we need to patch. Let's get these Cisco ASAs out of here. Everybody's moving to Palo. We should be doing the same. Like we should be investigating ASMs. We should be investigating SIM. We need to start talking about log consolidation. And you're just spewing Egyptian hieroglyphs at somebody that's a music major. And they have no fucking clue what you're talking about. And they're like, Everything you just said scares the shit out of me. We're not going to do any of that. I'm just going to sit on my hands for two years. I'm going to collect my bonus and I'm going to peace out. So you guys just make sure the building doesn't burn down. And they're like, okay, well, what about our budget? And they're like, no, I'm buying a yacht. Like we don't have a budget. We got $10 million, but you know, I bought, I bought uh, two houses in Rancho Santa Fe. So no. So like, it's a thing. Uh, and, 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 I have strong opinions on the thing because I have to go in and clean up these messes. <laughs> so like, um, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in CISO land. And, and like, obviously, you know, it's not every, not all of them, uh, obviously, but like the more egregious ones that tend to have the building burned down, so to speak, or they, the ones that make the news, um, the people that end up um, like, I'm dying to know what the details are. So here in San Diego, um, Scripps, which a, a major, um, a medical provider <clears throat> got hit the entire scripts network in all of San Diego, like seven hospitals or something went down and uh, had to go to pen and paper like Sony picture style had to go to pen and paper because they got burned down. So it's really interesting because like they had job postings for dozens of people. Like, so you would think that like they have security staff, right? Well, no, they and had job think- postings for security staff. Was that before the breach? Uh, yeah, years, years before the breach. Yeah. So like, it's a black box, right? I have no intel on scripts. I'm I'm completely speculating, but like you have an org, they have seven hospitals, they're all networked together. Like you can make assumptions based on what the topography of the inside of the network is going to look like based on just how many buildings they have and who they employ. And if you go look on, look on LinkedIn, you're going to find people that used to work there and you can start looking at what their expertises are and you can piece together OSN style, like what technologies are being used under the hood at scripts. So like if you wanted to, you could spend a week and just OSN your way to success and figure out like, what their technology stack is like, what's the networking vendor, like are the, what tech, what security technologies are they using, if any, and you, you can start to sort of shed some light on stuff by process of, of elimination that way. But like for them to get m- like steamrolled that bad that they had to go to pen and paper. And so far as I can tell, they're still on pen and paper. And this is, it's been like two months now. Um, like how bad did it have to be in there? Because the way I understand that these ransomware groups work is they will get shell and they will hang around inside the network for a while. And then they will make an active decision on whether or not they want to detonate ransomware. Uh, and then um, the RE evil guys actually um, released um, an interview with the press uh, last month, I want to say, uh, where they said, we actively target companies that have cyber insurance because we know that they will tap their cyber insurance to pay out for the ransomware uh, costs and we have a much higher degree of success in getting a payday if we hit a company that is insured because they'll just tap their insurance. And then they said, once they do that, then they go after the insurance company and they hit the insurance company the same way because they know the insurance company obviously has money. So like, if you think about it from the blue team side of things, for a ransomware team to be successful in that setup, uh, you have to have an attacker break into your network, move around inside laterally, investigate, do a bunch of reconnaissance, maintain access to whatever implants and payloads they're using for some period of time, and then make a decision of, should we pull the trigger to ransomware this organization or not? So like, what does your security program have to look like for that to be unnoticed? What, what What security program? Exactly. That's what I mean. That's exactly my point is like, there are organizations that will take a $10 million security budget, slice it up into bonuses for the executive staff and the leadership and give peanuts to the analysts at the bottom and tell them that there's no raises and no budget to buy tools or do anything. Um, so, so the people you, at the bottom, sorry, I guess. So do you think that like some of the answer to, I guess some of these problems, there's obviously a lot of problems in the industry, right? 
Do you think some of the answer is a blend of more budget or more people or different technology stacks, or are we just still missing fundamentals? Like where do we start to address this kind of top-down approach? There's a lot of places that do have good top-down leadership and, and some very smart yeah. CISOs, but how do we, as a, as a whole, we're seeing ransomware at you know many great companies, Oh yeah, fix this at, at a bigger thing is is a the attack surface management is that a good starting point for people? Do you think getting some of the fundamentals and looking for what assets like, where is your approach um, or your thought process of of how we start to address these? Uh, I'd say there's multiple moving pieces. Um, it's I want to say it's a trifecta. I think there's three three bits, and you try you got to get them all at once like tripod style. So like uh, a um, that when there's smoke, there's fire. If there's IIS 7 and 8.5 on your perimeter, there's problems. Like you can stop there and remediate those right away. Um, the other one is having competent leadership that has an idea of what the risks are involved. So like if you tell the music major, hey, we have operating systems that are attached to the perimeter that are in a DMZ in our data center that are more than 10 years old and will never be patched by Microsoft. These are to some degree, they could be considered an existential threat. Like if somebody breaks into this thing that hasn't been rebooted in four years, if you get into the Windows, you know, Windows Server 2008 R2 box that hasn't been rebooted in four years and Mimi cats that thing, you have a mountain of credentials and it's game over. Like that's it. That's the end of the assessment. You're done. Like you have DA almost certainly. So like um, you, you have some, You it's, it, my position is that you have to have some technical competency to lead a technical team. Like I'm I'm willing to bet that the days of like J random Ivy League graduate who has absolutely no experience whatsoever becoming in charge of security uh, are over because people are tired of that person not knowing what to do when someone like us comes to them and says, so we found Windows XP on your WAN and it appears to be um, somebody running a desktop like a physical computer in your office running Windows XP um, that somebody poked a hole in the firewall over and apparently none of your security staff and none of your IT staff are aware at all. Um, like for that finding to be communicated to leadership and leadership having no idea what to do with it is a big problem. Like leadership's job is to make decisions. And if they are not informed enough to make decisions, they're probably not the right leader, right? Like, shouldn't they rely on their team to get the answer if they don't understand? Or is there a, is yes. there a, it sounds like Dan, you're, there's a line, there's a minimum body of knowledge yeah. that needs to be yes, in place. Yes, absolutely. Like I'm not yeah. saying that you need to be able to read assembly. Yeah. I'm saying that like, if you, if, if I tell you, you have XP on your WAN and you don't like manufacture a perfectly geometrically accurate cube of diamond from your asshole at that moment, you're not the right person to be in charge. Sorry. Wow. Like, that's just the thing. If you're not producing gemstones with your butthole in sheer terror of being told that your 2021 perimeter has XP on it, like, that's bad. So, like, at the very, very least, like, you have to be able to make decisions. And if you can't make those decisions, then you're not a good security leader in that regard. So, like, that's one big problem. And that's probably one of the biggest ones. The other, ones is, the other one is perverse incentives, where nine out of ten places, generally speaking, um, will only do the absolute bare minimum that they are legally required to do, and usually less if they can get away with it, to pass their audits and nothing else. I have seen people who have AVP titles or or you know, um, security management or security leadership titles, largely again in finance organizations, whose entire job is curating a mountain of Excel spreadsheets and um, Excel spreadsheets and Word documents in an effort to like appease auditors when they come by. So they're, the security department doesn't actually do any security. It's all just document management and policy review. They manage a, a Confluence wiki with several thousand pages of very meticulously outlined uh, corporate policies, none of which are actually enforced in the real world. But when KPMG or EY or whoever is going to come by to do your audit, that's what they look at. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, by la in, in large part, is do you have a corporate policy and are you doing what you say you're doing in your corporate policy? So what they'll do is they'll put like a, fa a story I really like to tell about a thing I got to witness in real life was um, a, a finance uh, organization um, uh, who... Had they claimed they had? Remember NetWitness? 
like way back when those appliances, I think they still make them. Like it's RSA with NetWitness now, but before yeah, it yes. was like before RSA, RSA bought them. Yes. Yeah. So NetWitness was a really, really cool tool. And I never got a chance to mess with it. Um, and I had friends at the time who were working at Qualcomm and Qualcomm had this thing deployed and they were telling me these juicy stories about how NetWitness could, if you gave it enough PCAP data, presuming that like all your land WAN data is going across this, this backbone and you have like something silly like InfiniBand or some really, really fast link to capture everything across all the segments uh, and something like an Isilon. I guess that was the, at the time, that was the, the thing. If you were like super wealthy, you'd have like a, a stack of Isilons all running InfiniBand 40 gig. And then you'd have like NetWitness at the top of that rack with a card in it that did InfiniBand 40 gig. And then you had this ridiculous setup where like all the packets flowed into the Isilons and NetWitness had read access to all of that. So you could just be like, do the thing. And it would like, I've never seen this in person, but it is advertised to do this, that if somebody makes a Skype call, um, NetWitness will reassemble the Skype call out of the PCAPs and give you side-by-side -side video and audio of the call. And that was like, at the time, this was, I don't know, 2009. No, I mean, well, I learned about NetWitness, you know, back then, but like, this must have been 2011 or something like that. 20, no, 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 2013, something like that. Um, but um so this customer had um, NetWitness and I was like, Ooh, show me, I want to play. I've never, I've never got a chance to put my hands on NetWitness. Um, so they walk me to the data center and uh, they aim me at these two giant cardboard boxes on the floor at the end of the rack. <laughs> and I'm like, that's NetWitness. They're like, yeah. And I'm like, you said you had NetWitness. And they're like, we do have NetWitness. I'm like, no, you don't have we do, NetWitness. We use it as a table to play cards. It's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. it gets better. Oh, this is, I hope you guys are, uh, we're running a little, a little short on time, Dan. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God, I, I talk way too much. Um, no. Nice. Run, their run, excuse run. was, well, so what they said was, um, each of these units has its dual power supply, and each power supply is fifteen hundred watts. So we're talking three thousand watts per unit, and there's two units, so six kilowatts to run these two servers at full tilt. We need to plumb another thirty amp circuit and build a new rack to put these two units in because we're out of power. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. When do you plan on doing that? They're like, well, we're aiming for next quarter. Cool, next quarter is in three weeks. So three weeks later, I go back to them and I'm like, hey, can I play with NetWitness yet? I wanna play with NetWitness. Um, and it was a different guy that I talked to at that point because I guess the other guy moved, moved to a different department or left or whatever. New guy um, uh, says, okay, cool. Let me show you the NetWitness deployment. I'm like, oh, goody, I get to play. So they walk me into the data center, same two boxes are sitting in the same fucking spot. And I'm like, really? And he's like, so there's power considerations. And I'm like, go on. <laughs> let me he's guess. like, let me guess next quarter. So these are, huh? Let me guess next quarter. These, these units have dual power supplies and they're 3000 Watts each. And we have a power constraint and we need to plumb a new circuit in and to put a new rack in. And I'm like, when's it going to happen next quarter? <laughs> okay. Next quarter's in three months. So I went back three months later. Guess what happened? New guy? New guy. <laughs> same time. boxes, same location. Same story. Yep. Yep. And they skirted, and that's and that's what they told KPMG when KPMG came. And KPMG, KPMG was like, oh, cool, that's fine. Did, were the boxes empty, or were, did they actually have nope. stuff in them? Oh. It, it gets even better. They were still brand new in their shrink wrap. They had never been taken out. And the only reason that they were able to get away with this was because the boxes still hadn't been opened. And uh, they had been paying 80 grand a year to re-up the licenses every year for like three or four years running to get away with this scam. So when they got, the auditor said, I don't believe you, show me on paper that these are, this is legit. They could say, look, six months ago, we bought a, a 12 month license. So we have a current license. We just haven't deployed the things. Damn. And that was enough to get KPMG off their backs for a year. And I'm like, this is why everything is burning down. This exact practice of they have figured out ways to scam their way through compliance and literally do nothing. So and like it, it, we yeah. wonder why everybody gets hacked inside out like a fucking gym sock. It's because they have figured out ways to do nothing. And here's me screaming, going, "What the fuck do you people expect? Hey, Dan. You can't catch shit. The device you bought to catch Dan. the fucking bad guys is in a goddamn box. Dan. What are you doing? Dan. Hey, Dan. Dan. Dan." 
Oh, I have a question. Oh, so you <laughs> mentioned uh, you mentioned fire and buttholes, and I'm told that you are a chili pepper connoisseur. I manufacture and sell hot sauce that I call nope sauce. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Is there I'd a particular kind of chili pepper that goes into your hot sauce, or do you not disclose the... Oh, it's it's open source. If you go if you go troll through my uh, Twitter account far back enough, you'll see I have like whole threads of the manufacturing process. Like it's Sweet. almost open source at this point. Like, um, so uh, I live in a in a uh, suburb of, of San Diego, and where I live, apparently the soil is really uh, uh, bountiful. I guess to, to peppers, they they love it. Um, so we have let me think, black cobras, habaneros, something called a mad hatter, which I think is a yep. form of yep. habanero. Yep. Um, a hot burrito, which I'm, I don't even know what it is yet. I'm, I'm going to look for that on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Carolina Reapers, Trinidad Amaruga Scorpions, Seven Pot Brain Strain, Chiltepin, Thai, and, and, and then by volume, the biggest one is Manzano. We don't grow the Manzanos we're working on. We have like five or six Manzano plants, but they haven't gotten big enough to produce fruit yet. I have to go buy the Manzano. So the idea is like, by volume, um, I'll buy essentially like a five gallon bucket of manzanos. Uh, and then we cut them in half and de-seed them and then chuck them in like a fermentation tank and we ferment them for seven days. Hmm. And then we'll pull that out, we'll drain off the brine, blitz it into a uh, uh, paste and then push it through like a food mill so that we get like a strained version. And then that becomes like part of the sauce that so we add essentially what is the equivalent of like Italian red sauce. Um, uh, like our twist on it, right? So uh, tomatoes, um, red uh, bell peppers, uh, hatched chilies, onion, and flavors. And then we do the same thing with that. We cook it, uh, and then we blitz it and strain it, and then we add that to the fermented um, uh, pepper paste. And that's what we call the concentrate. Um, and then uh, we take that concentrate and we blend it 50-50 with mango puree. Ooh. And then if that's not hot enough, and it's usually not hot enough because manzanos, manzanos are really delicious. They're like the size of a plum. They're bright yellow or kind of like orange. Uh, and they, they have really thick skin like a bell pepper, but they have the kick of kind of a somewhere in between a jalapeno and a habanero, like a really angry jalapeno or kind of a weenie habanero. So they're spicy, but they're not like murder sauce. So that's the, that's the, the concentrate. And it's got this dark, like almost blood colored result. Uh, and then if that's not hot enough, um, all the peppers that I mentioned before we started making hot sauce, we have been taking those peppers and drying them in a Traeger and then blitzing them into powder and selling little keychain capsules of pepper powder, uh, on Etsy. And originally we were just giving them away at conferences and they were going like crazy and we started charging for them and they still went like crazy. And then we doubled how much we were charging for them and they still went like crazy. So we're like, well, okay, we're just going to keep doing this then. Um, but uh, if, if the, if the sauce isn't hot enough, then I add like a giant heaping spoon of the powder to that. And it's usually done in like one of those huge Rubbermaid 24 liter, like, like ki uh, professional kitchen container kind of dealies. Um, Dan, that was, that was a lot of information about chili peppers. Thank you. For that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I've, I've been doing it for like nine years now or eight years now. So it's just like this silly thing we do on the side for fun, it's awesome. but everyone needs yeah. a hobby. Dan, I, yeah. just have five, I just have five questions for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Let's do it. Three words to describe yourself. Overly caffeinated hacker. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A hammer. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? What? In just the, what? With a question. <laughs> your, your favorite hacker movie. Oh, probably antitrust. Oh, mm. choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, oh, dead, dead, fictional, fictional or otherwise. otherwise. Wait, fictional or otherwise? Uh, no, alive, dead, fictional or otherwise. Oh, 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 oh. oh. <clears throat> celebrity. Oh, not, boy. I, I never knew what the otherwise no. was. But. I think it'd be non-fictional. Isn't that alive or dead a person? Not necessarily. Mm. <clears throat> mm. Oh, that's a tough one. Can I can I think about that? We'll go to the next one. There is That's no the next last one. one. Oh, that was the last, last one. one. Well, shit. Okay. It's the last one, so we force you into saying something silly. All right. Um, Word association. Female. 
<laughs> male. Oh, I was thinking. I was gonna say like other Robert, they, Robert Downey Jr. as dad because he's like my think. I think he's my flavor of crazy. Um. So we got one. Yeah. And then. And then who don't you want to have the Oedipus complex about? Maybe Tilda Swinton because she's also my fl- my fl- flavor of crazy. There we go. Very good. Good answer, Dan. Thank you so much for appearing. Thank you for having me. It was just letting me talk for an hour and then losing. It's one of my character flaws is I will keep talking until you shove a sock in my mouth. (laughs) You know, on on this show, you made my job easy by just talking. So it worked worked to your advantage. (laughs) Thanks so much, Dan. With that, we'll take a short break and come back with Sumed Dakar from Qualys. Stick around. 